just as much as you think about the physical side of things or we're so used to thinking about our physical health, it's okay and it's just as important to think about your mental health. When your mental health is in a good form and you're being proactive and you will naturally perform better as well. That was Taylor Camo, a retired professional soccer player, sharing how she now thinks about her mental health after situational depression caused her to seek therapy. I'm a huge fan of soccer. I don't remember the exact moment I became a fan, but it feels like I've been one as long as I can remember. As a fan, I sit on my couch or in the stadium, following the roller coaster emotional journey of supporting a particular team. I'd always wondered what it's like to be on the pitch, with thousands of people watching and millions following from home. As I started to ask Taylor about her journey and how it affected her mental health, I started to understand the relentless drive it takes to make it and the sacrifices you make along the way. Sacrifices that surely affect your mental health. In this episode of Silent Superheroes, Taylor shares her experience growing up in a family of athletes and the competitive culture of the Bay Area. She talks about the drive it took to succeed and the difficult decisions and trade-offs she made while she was still in her teens. As a young adult, she talks about the conflict between her desire to continue to grow her career and the need to be able to spend more time with her family and friends. Finally, she recalls how she had to confront her situational depression and shares how she's doing today. Remember, Taylor and I are just two people talking about our personal experiences living with a mental illness. If something you hear inspires you to try something new, please consult with a trained medical professional before you do. My name is James Platt. I'm the host of Silent Superheroes, and I'm really glad that you're here. Welcome to the Silent Superheroes podcast, a series of frank conversations about mental health at work. So welcome to Silent Superheroes. I'm here with today's guest, Taylor Camo. Taylor, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Now, Taylor, you're a retired professional soccer player, and today we're going to talk about the relationship between mental health and mental illness. So I thought maybe we should just start by asking, what do you do right now? If you're a retired pro soccer player, how do you, uh, how do you fill your time? Um, my current profession is I work for a company called Modern Health. Um, We basically offer a mental health benefit for employers, breaking down that access to care, whether it's with a coach or a therapist, we're able to get people access to like personalized care quickly. Um, And I help sell it. So you're a a salesperson. I am, which is the typical athlete to salesperson story. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, A tale as old as time. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And I actually resisted it for a while and then I just embraced it. So it sounds like there's there's quite a journey in there um, Mm -hmm. from pro athletes through to salesperson selling uh, on behalf of mental health or on behalf of modern health, I should say. So let's go back to the start. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? I was born in the South Bay. I was born in Los Gatos, California, and I grew up in the Bay Area. So I was kind of around the Silicon Valley tech hustle life from the beginning. Was your family in that profession, in that that tech sector? Yeah, my dad worked for Apple before he worked for HP. I think (laughs) <laughs> I think we joke about maybe he left Apple a little too early. <laughs> <laughs> but I grew up with a family of athletes as well. I'm the youngest of four siblings and we all played sports. It's just a natural thing to fall into that lifestyle and pick up sports. And we all played together growing up. And Let's go oldest to youngest then. What was what was the sports that everybody everybody played? My oldest brother probably would say football. Um, my second oldest brother played lacrosse at Cal Poly, but he also played football in high school. And then my sister played field hockey at Cal. So then coming down to the youngest, what was your, what was your game? Um, I was known as the soccer player, um, for a long time. 
uh, even till you know professional life. I think when my parents and they would talk about me and they'd be proud and they would say my daughter plays soccer professionally. And when I would meet people, I would say, Hey, I, my name's Taylor. I'm the youngest. Um, and they would say, Oh, you're the soccer player. So that was what I was known for <laughs> was being the soccer player. How did you discover soccer? You had all the other sport going on. How did you end up playing that? Now that I look back on it, that some of my favorite memories is just being on grass is nostalgic for me. I think something about soccer too is that you could always get better. There's something that you can learn. It's such a strategic sport. I had the most fun probably playing it when I was growing up when I had to make the decision of do you want to do basketball? Do you want to do soccer? In high school, soccer was pretty much my number one always. So how did you know as you were growing up that you were good? Where you got to you must have shows of talent along the way. I was very competitive. So I don't wouldn't undermine my drive when I was playing. Um, I think that's one of the things that got me to stand out. Even at the professional level, I was more of a, a scrappy, hard worker. But I think to not sound cocky, I was athletic. So also at the professional level, something that made me stand out was the fitness testing. I was always kind of one of the top performers or top scorers on fitness tests so you kept you kept going so you know you picked up soccer from being a you know you know, tiny tiny little kid and you kept going kept going kept going so just walk us through those steps how do you get from being a kid that you know first steps is kicking a soccer ball through to you know you're you're in college and then ultimately get into the pro leagues Yeah, I think in the U.S. at least, I know it's different in Europe. You play at the club level. uh, You can play at a competitive travel team. And then from there, you get recruited with college coaches. I think my recruiting process was I went to the Cal Berkeley summer camp. And then from there, that coach, Neil McGuire, would watch me during the club tournaments, the more competitive club tournaments, uh, where all the college coaches would go. And I mean, I think for women and men, you kind of verbally commit to college coaches your freshman to sophomore year of high school. You can't legally commit or sign something, but you verbally commit to a team when you're 14 years old. So that sounds like from a kind of like a mental health perspective, um, like there's a lot going on there when you're so much going in on. high school. Like how is that affecting you, do you think? It affects you in a good and a bad way. You're being praised for being good at something, right? But I think for the long term, as I'm sure we'll get into, your identity is being ingrained more and more into your sport. You get all these wonderful things for being good at something, like a full ride to a D1 school that's really well known. Can The pressure can build up at such a young age and you don't even start like realize it, that all these decisions can impact you later, which... For me, I actually wasn't really going into national team camps. So if you want to get to the Olympic or the World Cup level at 15, at 14, at 13, you need to start going to national team camps. And for me, it was like even at that young of an age, it was a decision of do you want to have friends from your high school or do you want to go to these national team camps? Do you want to go to school dances or do you want to go to national team camps? And at that age I made I was kind of saying I didn't want to go to the national team camps I wanted to go to the school dance but then when I got to college it shifted and my goal was to go to national team camps to get the opportunity to be in Olympics and World Cup and then it shifted again as I'm sure we'll go get to so I mean at the time it's interesting that you you were offered a trade-off and the trade-off you chose to make was I want more more life than, yeah. you know, than yeah. like you know than than soccer. It's a hard it's decision to make at thirteen or fourteen. My mom, I remember, sat me down and was like, "You have the opportunity to go to this camp for like U.S. national team or at you know U fifteen, U sixteen, U.S. national team, but you'll be going right after your club cam- uh, tournament, so you'll be gone for about a month. At that age, it's just like, uh, how do I make the decision? What am I supposed to do? <laughs> so you went to college, mm-hmm. played soccer in college. Um, where did you Where did you go? I went to Cal Berkeley. 
uh, and played soccer there for okay. the full four years. Yeah. You know, as you go through that time, that drive sounds like still in still in place, desire to to succeed. And almost picked up. Uh, I was wanting and pushing for those national team camps. I did get invited to a U twenty national team camp and that's when my drive kind of kicked in even more where my goals were at that point to make the Olympics, to make a world cup team. And each step, it occurs to me that you are focused on the next step, climbing the ladder or whatever we, we would call it, right? High school, you focused on getting to college, college, you focused on you know getting into the, into the pro leagues and maybe eventually the, the world cup. So what's the, how did you end up going from your playing uh, in college to your playing pro soccer? So I actually didn't get drafted, which was pretty devastating, kind of hurt to the ego at that point. I had gotten recognition at the Pac-12 Pac level and I'd gotten recognition at regional levels and stuff like that in college, but I didn't get drafted and I kind of was not understanding why. So the Portland coach, I think he didn't actually have a draft that year or draft pick. So he reached out to me and said, Hey, I want you to come into preseason. I've talked to your coach. Um, you'll probably get playing time because of the world cup. And we have so many world cup players, including Alex Morgan, Tobin Heath, uh, Christine Sinclair, like people that are big players for their teams. So they're going to be gone and the NWCL still plays games and you'll get, you could get time. And so to me, as a rookie, I was like, yeah, go into that environment, play with the best players in the world, maybe get some time. That sounds great. So I decided to go to Portland. So you make it, you know, you get pretty much where any young soccer player would want to get to playing, playing pro soccer. Mm -hmm. And you play for a number of different clubs during your career. So like, what are some of the highs of that experience for you? I think getting that first like professional contract coming from someone that's not getting drafted. And then for women's soccer, it is competitive because there's only nine teams. And then as the league continues to grow, it's harder and harder to get a contract because people don't retire for multiple years because they enjoy playing. And then there's also World Cup players from other countries coming to play in the U.S., let alone the U.S. national team, which has gotten a lot of recognition and we all know how good they are. Um, so I think making a team, being a consistent player and getting time in the league, let alone is tough. So I guess that's the high of my career was being recognized on that level. So, you know, some highs during your career being on the um, kind of, you know, best 11, but then at some point things started to change. The closer I got to that level of getting I never actually got called into a full team camp at uh, the professional level but coaches talking to me about I mean the position that I was playing at the time was needed at the on the national team or at least a backup or whatever it was uh, and getting those conversations of oh the coach is looking at you thinking about calling you in this and that but these are the things you need to do a lot of female players play in Australia in the off season one, because female players don't make enough money. So they basically play year round, which is such a grind. And two, it's to get more games in to continue to elevate your game. And then a lot of people can get the opportunity called into the national camp if you're continuing to play. And I was told that that's what I would need to do. But by the time the off season came around, I just wanted to break. I was getting really burnt out for this from the season. And I wanted to spend time with my family. Um, so that's when things started to shift of the sacrifices you have to make to get to a certain level was starting to wear on me after five years. You've done five years of hard graft, five years driving to be the best player you could. Mm -hmm. And you started to realize that some, maybe your priorities, you know, were a little, were a little different. It's kind of interesting. You were saying earlier about how you wanted to be you know, to go to the prom or whatever over, you know, go to the, go to the national camp. So how did this start to play out? You see the shifting sense of, of priorities. What, what happened? Um, I think the older I got, the closer I was to that lifestyle. I realized
realize that you do have to sacrifice time with family. You do have to sacrifice the weddings, the engagement parties, these life moments for people that you really care about to get to that level. And I wasn't really willing to sacrifice that to become that type of player that you need. You need to you need to put in that work. You need to put in that time. You need to sacrifice those things. And I wanted to have those relationships with my family. And honestly, I also started master. I was starting to get interested in business and what would I do after? And so those thoughts started to creep in and I started to realize what I was missing out on. So there's a lot going on there and a lot in conflict. You have the identity that you have built over, you know, two two decades of who you are as a soccer player you have family friends that you want to that you want to see a burgeoning interest in in business how did that start to affect you like all those competing um, things yeah I think when I went back for my final season I was thinking about the idea of retiring and I think when you're an athlete and you've invested so much of yourself in the sport and so much of your identity into something, it's really tough to figure out how to let it go. And you're also thinking, what is my identity outside of this? What is my identity away from my sport? What do I do afterwards? You know, you create this relationship with yourself and the sport and you have confidence from it too, because you're good at something. So it's hard to walk away from something like that. Um, And then I would also get those outside factors, those outside voices coming in of, well, once you're done, you'll never be able to go back. Or yeah, you think that you could go into the working world, but that's also a grind sitting at a desk eight hours a day, which I totally understand it is. But I also was thinking in my head, well, you don't know what I'm doing. Like you it's hard for you to tell me how hard this is if you aren't doing it. So how did it affect your game in that last, that last season? These, you know, yeah. conflicts? to be honest, I barely trained in the off season and that should have been my red flag there of don't go back because I was barely playing soccer. I was barely doing the workouts. I mean, I still, cause I'm competitive. I still wanted to win those fitness tests and, the fact that I wasn't playing soccer as much as I should have in the off season should have been my red flag to you're done with this. Like you need to, you need to step away from the sport. That's the story of how Taylor went from an infant kicking a soccer ball in a family of athletes to playing professional soccer with some of the best women in the US. It's a journey of tough decisions, like deciding which college you'll commit to in early teens. It's a journey of hard work, trying to top the fitness list in pre-season training. It's a journey of relentlessly driving to the next milestone. Playing soccer in the US is pretty much the top of the tree as far as the women's game goes. Having reached the top, we pick up Taylor's story as the tension between her playing career and personal life starts to play out. How was your mental health faring through that last season? Um, Well, I was definitely starting to struggle personally. I was, well, I actually also broke my arm in (laughs) my last season. So I was sitting out, which made, which heightened everything. I was only in Houston to play soccer. There was no other reason I was in Houston and I had broken my arm, which kind of put things even more into perspective of you're not playing, you're just sitting in Houston. And of course I had friends on the team, but um, I had more time to think about why I was there and I was starting to struggle. And I also had a family member that was um, sick. So all these things kind of adding up started to, weigh on me. And that was when I decided to talk to a therapist because I felt like I needed help with the decision that I was weighing. How did you find your therapist down there in Houston? Yeah, I had, so my first kind of relationship or introduction to mental health was I had a family member who 
suffered from something a little more clinical. That was the only reason I feel like at that point that I knew to talk to a therapist just to talk through what I was going through with someone. She kind of guided me to, hey, maybe this would be a good idea. And then I was thinking, you know what, I think it would be a good idea. I think I do need to talk to a third party, uh, get a different perspective. Because when you're talking to family and friends, as much as they want to help you, they also have a bias weigh in on what's going on. Maybe a bias towards you being the soccer player. Yeah, the identity that they knew me as. Um, and I found them through, I honestly think it was maybe like psychology.com or I didn't go through insurance or anything like that. I went outside of insurance to find somebody. There wasn't a like special therapist that worked with uh, athletes or something like that? No, but I did look for qualifications of work or professional development and family and stuff like that. So I could talk to her about a professional decision that was also weighing on my mental health at the time. What did you learn by going through a therapist? What came out of that for you? Well, I think I learned that you could have something like situational depression that is a thing. I also learned that there is a difference between mental illness and mental health. At that point, I was probably leaning towards more of a clinical need. But after I came out of that, I realized that my relationship with mental health has changed, although I'm not somebody who suffers from something clinical consistently. You can fall into that and seek the help, but I think I only had about three therapy sessions and I felt like I got what I needed. And then my relationship with mental health now is that I can still think about it and work on it and be proactive about it. And I don't need to be suffering from something clinical consistently to think about it because I was in that place. And I think if I had a relationship with my own mental health before then, I probably would have knew that I needed to retire before that I pushed myself to the point where I was. So your last season, you, know, you kind of know you're leaving. You break your arm, you're sat, sat on the bench, you go see a therapist to try and sort of work on some of these, you know, difficult feelings. You learn about situational depression. So like your final, your last game comes around and it's like it's done how mm -hmm. does that feel i think at that point i was so burnt out and so i was putting all this pressure on myself to continue to play that when i told the coach that i wanted to retire it was just like this huge weight lifted and it was an automatic change to my mood how i was feeling i felt motivated again to do something else it was just like a huge weight lifted off my shoulders of like, I've made this decision. I realize it's the right decision now because of how I feel in this moment. Just to reflect to you, as you started that answer, it looked and sounded almost like you were apologizing for it. <laughs> I, I felt a great sense of relief for you that that journey was over and like that you made the right decision for yourself and you chose not to persist with the identity that was no longer serving you I think that's great it still feels a part of my identity like I still consider myself an athlete but I don't need to be this Olympian or world cup level to do that as many people don't need that I mean people do triathlons or workout or whatever it is they do physically and still consider themselves an athlete I think. So how has life changed for you you know as you've put that pro soccer career behind you and moved into into business what's changed? Yeah I think at first it's tough to navigate that change I think as humans we just naturally don't love change and if you are so good at something for so long that it's tough to kind of start at the bottom again, basically. Um, so I knew when I wanted to kind of get into sales and get into selling something that I really cared about, 
that I needed that motivation to master a new craft and sell something that I actually cared about because for me, I realized I had this passion for this thing for so long that I I wanted to make sure that whatever I got into next, I had a passion for as well. So I think what's changed for me now is that I have this passion to grow and learn and sell something that I care about. Right. Which is software that helps people get access to mental health care. Right. Yep. Yeah. It's a software that basically, let's say my soccer team had it. (laughs) I could have seen a therapist or a coach to talk about my mental health. At this point, I'm probably more in the coaching range of I can talk about my mental health with a coach and my mental wellness and be proactive and just better myself, which is something I'm comfortable with, right? The word coach is something that's familiar to me. So it it kind of was like easy to fall in and understand what a emotional and mental health coach is and explain that to other people is like, it's something, it's okay to have that relationship with mental health and not have a mental illness. There, I still think there's a stigma around being proactive about your mental health. And it's just shifting the conversation away from you are in trouble or you are less because you need or want to talk about your mental health as I think there's still just like that stigma, mental health or even mental or mental illness where it's like, why would you talk like why talk about it? It's a topic that we shouldn't talk about freely. What would be your advice to somebody who is experiencing situational depression versus clinical depression? That it's okay to see a therapist, even if it's just a couple sessions. It doesn't have to be a long relationship that goes on and on and on and on. Like It doesn't. She helped me a lot with just three sessions. So it's okay. <laughs> and then if you, you know, there's a you know pro athlete who's, coming up, you know, in high school or college or something, what advice would you give them for managing their mental health? I think just as much as you think about the physical side of things, or we're so used to thinking about our physical health, it's okay. And it's just as important to think about your mental health in all aspects. When your mental health is in a good form and you're being proactive and you will naturally perform better as well. I know a lot of people are getting into meditation and mindfulness. And I was starting to get into that as an athlete. And I realized that that helped my performance. But you can also talk about your mental health emotionally without needing a clinical therapist. Wherever that is, I think now it's tough for the younger generation to get access to mental health proactively, but... They're talking about it more, is my perception. Yeah. Even, yeah. Even my kids in school, they have classes or parts of classes where they talk about their emotions and, and where they're at. And I could say with certainty, and I grew up in the UK, so maybe it's different, but we never talked about our emotions at school ever. So. I agree. And I thought about that when I joined Modern Health. I was thinking, why aren't there classes around mental health for people growing up? Because then you can think about mental health in a proactive way and start to build that relationship with your mental health in a similar way you build the relationship with your physical health. And hopefully it's a healthy relationship because people also have unhealthy relationships with their physical health. And you talk about that growing up, but you don't talk about your mental health growing up. So if you could go back to the start of your pro career, give yourself like a message, a piece of advice, an affirmation, what would you, what would you say? I think about this often of enjoy like don't put so much pressure on yourself have fun like find fun what you're doing because I put so much pressure on myself to be because when I started that was fresh out of college the pressure to be an Olympic athlete or be a World Cup player was top of mind all the time and I feel like a lot of people talk about this now but if you can't enjoy what you're doing to get to that point you're not going to get to that point. And I would tell myself it's okay to have your goals change because that's what was shifting for me was what was I enjoying and I wasn't enjoying that lifestyle anymore. So it's okay to 
have your goals shift as a person. And now my goals are to help more people. And that's great. And I, at the time, didn't realize that, you know, I could change my goals and things could change. And so just enjoy what you're doing in the moment and enjoy it for what it is. It's probably what I tell myself. I think that's wise advice for anybody, whether it's pro sports or you're selling for, you know, modern health or recording a podcast that, you know, enjoy it. Life really is short. A lot of people put a lot of pressure on themselves to do certain things and stay up late and work and get the next promotion or whatever it is. And it starts to weigh on you. And now that I work with a coach, I can help set those guidelines of, um, I was, remember working with a coach with Modern Health uh, when I was first starting. And it was fun to have that conversation of, okay, what does this transition look like for me? How can I build these steps and enjoy what I'm doing and kind of navigate this change in a proactive way? I think that that was just really helpful to start working with a coach, which was actually my first time ever working with a coach in the sense of like an emotional, mental health type of conversation. Taylor, I have really enjoyed listening to your story. Before we wrap up, is there anything else that you wanted to to say or to share? The last thing I want to share is that it is okay to have a relationship with your mental health without being a mental illness. I think this conversation is starting to change and I'm happy that people are starting to be proactive and think about their mental health in a different way. But if I was proactive with my mental health, I don't think I would have gotten into a spot where I was at with situational situational depression. And it's also okay to get to a point of situational depression. Life happens and life can be really hard, but you can also think about your mental health in a different way and just build that relationship with yourself. Taylor, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, James. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Bye. Most jobs have their stresses and strains. Maybe to you, your job is just a job. You go to work, you get paid, you go home. Nothing wrong with that. Some people treat each job as a step or the next rung on the ladder, ever climbing towards the summit. It's that old story of the person who starts working in the mailroom and ends up in the CEO's office. That sort of climb is long and arduous, requiring hard work and long hours. From the outside, being a pro athlete can look like the best job in the world. Thousands of fans chanting your name, lucrative sponsorships and shoes with your name stitched into them. But where we see fame and glory, Taylor sees a job, requiring constant hard work to stay at the top of your game, and disappointments along the way like being sidelined. What does it take to make it to the top of professional soccer? Just like reaching the boardroom from the mailroom. It requires commitment, extraordinary effort, and huge sacrifice. For Taylor, there were considerable sacrifices, like hard training sessions when she wanted to be with her family or go to a friend's wedding. It was those sacrifices that led her to her situational depression, even though she was building a successful career that many people would dream of. Fortunately, she was familiar with the idea of therapy, so when she felt her head wasn't in the right place, she was courageous enough to straight away ask for help. Most important of all is Taylor's realization that her mental health requires exactly the same care and attention as her physical health. She was, by her own judgment, one of the fittest players on the team because she worked so hard on it. We don't all need to work on mental health with the same intensity that a pro athlete focuses on their physical fitness, but we do need to proactively pay attention to our mental health and have a plan for maintaining it. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you've heard something that you think somebody else might like to hear, please share the podcast with them. If you want updates on new episodes as they're released, you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash silent superheroes or sign up for our newsletter at silentsuperheroes.com. Take your mental health seriously. If you need to speak to someone, you can call one 800 273 8255 or text crisistextline.org at 741-741. Both provide 24-7 confidential counseling to people in the United States. Worldwide, visit iasp.info slash resources slash crisis underscore centers slash 
To help others find the Silent Superheroes podcast, please leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcasting service.